This is the Say It Can't Gamer, and you are live with the MMA Home! Mixed Martial A-Holes! MMA Marshall A. No way. Oh! From the Queen Studios of New York, number eight ranked UFC bantamweight fighter, Aljamain Sterling's here live with the MMA. Oh! What's up, MMA hoes? I hope everyone's good tonight. It is Wednesday night, TGIW, and man, I am excited. I hope you guys are excited right now. We have a chat room full of misfits over here. We have Long Island's own Aljamain Sterling live with the MMA holes eating ice cream. Oh my God. Holy smokes. Look at this. He's eating the ice cream. It is wonderful, wonderful. Aljamain, welcome to the show, my friends. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's a pleasure to have you on. Now, you have a big fight coming up. UFC AC, New Jersey. I mean, on the East Coast, representing right now, and you're eating this ice cream. This must be a very intense training camp that you're in. Very intense. You know, I take my uh, calories very serious. I got to make sure I'm uh, carb loading and making sure I'm ready to go, keep the uh, cardio tank on full. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. I mean, I've never seen this before. Uh, everyone's eating this grilled chicken and vegetables and all this stuff. And you got, what, what flavor ice cream is that? Uh, cookie dough. Cookie dough. <laughs> well, that's, is it, well, it's, um, is it uh, organic cookie dough? How's this work? Uh, I don't, I don't think it's organic. But, no? <laughs> um, I don't think it cause, I don't, yeah, I don't think it uh, made it on the list. Now, is this, is this a Matt Sarah thing? Is this, is this a Matt Sarah uh, training, uh, reg, uh, routine over here that you got going on how would you learn this from <laughs> uh it's kind of my own thing i i eat a lot of sweets man when i start cutting down and my weight gets starts to get lower i get you know, like these weird cravings i just gotta you gotta feed it man you gotta feed the machine that's what i was i feed the machine and keep the machine happy now this is your first time on the mma holes this is a flying circus of misfits i got a bunch of lunatics in this chat room over here and i see that you have a youtube channel as well and what I'm going to do is this. I have on screen right now your YouTube channel, and you have 1,048 subscribers. Look at this. You, you already have 1,048 subscribers over here. And my plan for today's show is to pump up them subscribers, throw some more subscribers your way, and get you going with this uh, YouTube channel. Oh, hey, who we got over here? Oh, photo bombing over here. What's She's going on? <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> now, is this the missus, girlfriend, wife? Who we got over here? Yeah, that's her. Oh, okay. She's a little shy. Huh? <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is unbelievable. I mean, I can't believe it. This is her. This is her big moment. I mean, you would think that she would like, you know, being on camera and everything like that. This is <laughs> no. No, nah, she doesn't really like that stuff. So. Oh well. well. What are you gonna do? I mean, so I guess you're the celebrity of the uh, of the household right now, huh? For now. <laughs> For now. <laughs> We're working on her right. Now. Getting there. There we go. So Long Island, New York. I I am an East Coast guy. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows from my accent and stuff like that. But um, everyone tells me that I always favor the uh, the East Coast guys. They don't favor the the West Coast guys over here. And I, I'm starting to believe that this is the case right now. So I'm going to say negative things so people don't think that I just favor East Coast fighters. Uh, Strong Island, represent. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, Coast, represent over Coast. here. Now, okay. Uh, you have uh, Matt Sarah's gym, right? Uh, was it Lu Luongo, uh, Weidman, Sarah? They're all at this gym that you train at? They're two different locations, but um, we, we cross-train a lot. Oh, okay. Now, how is it with these guys, these crazy guys? I mean, Ally Kinta, I, I, I'm not sure if he's at your gym as well. or I mean, all these, these crazy characters that you get to train with, how do you get anything accomplished? <laughs> I don't know if you saw my post today on Instagram. Uh, that, that was our... From this morning, our weightlift circuit with um, Tony Ricci, uh, Chris Weidman, and I, and, and he's over here dancing behind me while I'm trying to work on my core workout and all these things. You know, so then we end up having a full-on dance battle. Um, I think Chris was more so doing the the Irish, the <laughs> Irish uh, river dancing thing. Yeah, uh, that was called. But uh, 
he had a little hopping thing. I don't know, but it wasn't pretty for him. It wasn't pretty for him. But uh, we have a we have a good chemistry, man. I, I love these guys. We always uh, we always manage to make practice and training a lot more fun and uh, tolerable. You know, you, you start beating your body up and you're sore and you're waking up and you, you don't feel really feel motivated to get to the gym. But, you know, these guys are going to be there. And you know, it's going to always be a great time. And you guys are going to get through it together. And um, it just makes training camp a lot more fun. Sure, I bet. Now, I got the uh, video on the screen. I'm going to show the... Uh, the uh... Oh. All right, here he is. He's Al Jermaine. He's uh he's flexing, yeah. and there's some man creeping up behind you over here. <laughs> I don't know. Right, I'm gonna your story this. It's very romantic. I mean, it's. <laughs> oh my goodness, he's really getting down. There's some dancing. Jesus Christ. Wait for the battle rap. <laughs> All right, let me keep it going here. Check this out, guys. Oh, here we go. Yo. Stop failing drug tests. Stop failing drug tests. Not cool. You gotta know what you put in your body. Cause they saw and be a monster. Oh. <laughs> oh, that is great. That is absolutely great. That's priceless over there. Now that happened today. That happened this morning. I don't know how we were supposed to get through the workouts doing that, but uh, we got through it. Oh my God, <laughs> Jesus Christ! What what a what a character what a bunch of characters you got going on over there i uh i got the pleasure i had the pleasure to work with uh chris at um his gotham magazine shoot and god damn he's a funny dude he is a really a funny guy he always has the right thing to say at the right time i mean uh what a funny dude over there what, what's it like training with chris i mean i mean an accomplished wrestler uh a gigantic animal like he's tremendous what is it like training with chris wyman it's it's fun you know it's very competitive we both are very similar in our in our styles in terms of grappling and top heavy wrestling. So um, you know, anytime he's trying to do something, I'm trying to do it just as well. I'm learning a lot from him, him showing me stuff. And obviously, he's a lot bigger than me, but we get to roll with each other. Uh, we don't spar with each other; way too big for me. Yeah. But um, we'll play sparring a man. He'll you know kind of show me some things that he he likes to do and he likes to try. And uh, it's it's fun, you know. It's uh very uh family oriented feel for for our training camp I, I i truly do believe that um the majority of us i will say probably all of us we just want to see each other win and succeed and i think that's what it's all about when you got guys that are really 100 percent behind you and uh not like the video but 100 percent behind <laughs> you <laughs> well I, I noticed even when you guys went to the ufc facility i noticed you uh new york represented you guys seem to be the loudest group out of the whole yeah. house over there. I mean, <laughs> what was that like? Were people like, oh, get these guys out of here? I mean, you guys seem like the loudest people over there. They probably thought we were a little crazy. They, <laughs> and they're probably not too far off from that. I think we're all a little wacky in our own little way. Yeah. Uh, you get all of us together in a room, and I think it's just nothing but uh, a good recipe for for uh, good content and good TV. Yeah, we're live with Al Jermaine Sterling, uh, UFC 8th ranked bantamweight fighter over here, and you mentioned wrestling. Okay, I'm looking at your background over here, and it says you're a pro since 2011, <laughs> Cage Fury champion. Uh, let's see, two-time NCAA Division Three All-American. Uh, geez, you have some resume over here. And what stands out the most is this, Go to when, you went to college with John Jones? What is this about? Yeah, and I don't know, I don't know if they have the ring of combat champion, but... It, we can't make that slide. You know, yeah, that's true. That. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, I did go to college for a year with John Jones. About, well, actually a semester because he he didn't come back the second semester. But uh, we stayed in touch on my state, that kind of thing. Um, he was actually training at the gym right down the road from where I went to college. When I, I transferred college from Mooresville to SUNY Cortland. And he was trained down the road. And I told him, I was like, yo, bro, I want to come down, check it out. Um, I think I could be good at this stuff. That was like my exact words. Like, I think I could be good at this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he didn't think I was going to come down. I came down and I, you know, I never looked back since. You know, I was training up there. And as soon as I was done with college, I moved back home to Long Island, Strong Island. And uh, uh, we've been just improving and moving on ever since. Now, uh, everyone in the chat, they keep on bringing this up. They're like, when are they going to run back this fight over here with Brian, uh, Brian Caraway? This fight over here. I mean... <laughs> I thought you got robbed in this fight, and a lot of people in the chat room are talking about it. What What are your thoughts on this fight over here? This was a big fight in your career, and it kind of went the wrong way. You started off super strong in that fight, and then somehow uh, Brian Carey got the decision. What are your thoughts, you know, in hindsight, looking back at this fight? 
Uh, you know, I think experience won him that fight. Even though I do think if they judged it the right way, it should have been a draw, 28-28. I think that first round was more than definitely a a ten eight round, but um, I you know I don't I don't make the rules and I don't I don't know I don't I don't know what the judges are looking at, but even John McCarthy came after the fight and said the same thing. He was like that fight should have been a draw, ten first round, ten eight. Um, he probably probably got the second and third round, but uh, I think that's the one thing I learned from that experience. I had a great training camp. I was in great shape. Uh, the day of the fight. I did three workouts, woke up, because we were, like, one of the first first fights because it was the fight pass, exclusive fight pass prelims, um, feature fight, whatever that's, you know, whatever that means. So um, we're fighting for the king of fight pass, to be the king of fight pass. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean. uh, I wake up super early. I woke up probably, like, 5.30 in the morning, woke up and did my sprints, opened up the lungs, which I always do one workout the day of the fight and then mm. i just do my warm up in the back which is not very long and then i get ready for the fight so i did that and then i did like another hour and a half probably that that really killed me i think um after the first round i started off super strong and then after that i just could not keep up that pace that i did in the first round and uh yeah that's i think that's what that was it's experience and i want to win so bad that i was willing to push myself even more to get that win and uh it killed me and uh that's one of the things when the work is done the work is done you just gotta trust and believe in that yeah we're live with al Jermaine sterling the funk master where did you get this nickname the funk master i mean i'm sure a lot of people have asked you this but i want to know the answer here uh you know what man i got this from kind of like a tribute to my wrestling style um it's also a tribute to ben ashkin i mimic a lot of my wrestling style for that guy in college Everything he did from the NCAA coffee to the oh, oh, we got we got a silver t- a coffee tip dance. dance. Hold on one second. Dance, Donation dance, coming in. Dance, Interrupting dance, the show. Thank you. All right, here we go. Marky Wahoo has a question. I like this dude. I'm a fan. Dude keeps it real. There you go. He just says that he likes this dude. He's a fan, and you keep it real. There you go. No question over there. He just he's a fan. Marky Wahoo. How about that? Was that a guy? Uh, that was a guy. Well, we have a, a woman say everything, so they type it in, and a woman says it. So oh, they say okay. horrible I things. And... Thing. I was like, right. <laughs> yeah, it's a transgender. What are you gonna do? We have weird viewers over here. <laughs> well, thank, thank you anyway. Thank you. I appreciate that. There you go. How about that? Starting off the show with a nice comment. That's that's a first over here on the MMA. Let's keep up the nice comments over there. Uh, <laughs> now I got, I got thick skin. Good thing I got thick skin. Yeah. Well, well, listen, I mean, this is interesting, right? I'm looking at you into the UFC. You come into the UFC in 2014, and then you go on a four-fight win streak. So, first of all, I want to know, when you got the call to come to the UFC, on a level of 1 to 10, I mean, how excited were you to get that call? I was uh, on a level of 1 to 10. I was definitely a 10. The only problem that I was having was I was in the middle of drinking a beer. (laughs) (laughs) So... As soon as I got the call and I and I and I heard, I was like, I took the beer and I passed it to my friend. And I said, uh, "I'm not gonna need this anymore. I got four weeks to to put in some real hard work and get ready for this fight, short notice fight." And I was originally supposed to fight um, Lucas Martins, and then he got hurt and I ended up fighting Cody Gibson. But I was I was pumped, man. I there was nothing that was gonna stop me from uh, from uh, getting getting my hand raised on that night. So I made sure I was, stopped drinking, cut went cold turkey, and uh, put myself in the best position to win as best as I could. How is it to change your lifestyle like that? I mean, you're young, you're, you're, you're at the top of your game right now, you know, you're partying, having a good time. And now you get the call from the UFC. How tough is it to make that life change? Uh, it's pretty tough, man. I, I was coming off a win, uh, first round finish about a minute and 30 seconds in the first round. Um, in November, I think November 2nd, I was just coming back from surgery and I was supposed to have one more fight with Cage Fury before I got signed because the UFC said I wasn't ready. Brian Caraway actually got hurt, mm. and that was the reason why I, that was the reason why I actually got into the UFC because he pulled out of a fight, and it was just so funny how everything came full circle, and then we ended up fighting. Um, yeah, so I wasn't supposed to fight again until like April. So to take that fight in 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 February, knowing that I was just hanging out partying and I was I was going nuts. Uh, I, I knew I was like, dude, I got to really make up for a lot of lost time to uh, be anywhere near in shape to go 15 minutes. Mm. 
Now we're live with Al Jermaine Sterling on the MMA holes. This is exciting stuff. A strong island representing. Now you, next to you, you said was your girlfriend or your wife? I don't know if we got my that. girlfriend. Your girlfriend. Okay. Now how long have you guys been dating for over here? Wife. <laughs> Soon to be seven wife. seven years. Oh, seven. She's, she's actually she's actually saying hello now. Say hello. Hello. How are you? Hello. Okay, so <laughs> seven years. So she was with you through everything. Now she's with you as you made your rise into the UFC. How tough is it for her to watch you get into that cage and compete? I don't know. I feel like she's she's kind of like go in there and kick his ass. I think right. that she's kind of like that now at this point. But um, I know in the beginning it was very uh, nerve wracking for sure. Mm. Uh, even for myself, I'm, we were actually talking about this today. Uh, this morning, we were working out when Chris and I were finished working up, finishing our workout. My brother, he's actually fighting this Saturday for Cage Fury, his second pro fight. Um, and we were just talking about like just like this the history of why we fight and everything. And I remember one fight. I think it was my first title defense against Sadeko Honorio. I'm in the back room. I'm warming up. I felt confident, and then there was just like a lull in the like just a big void and we were sitting down and I'm on the floor. I normally sit on the floor. I've done that in the UFC as well. I just sit on the floor. I don't really, I don't use a stool and uh, I'm stretching and there's just a pitch drops, like pin drops silence. And, and out of nowhere, I just go, man, why do we do this crazy sport? I don't know why I do this. This is crazy. Why, why, why am I about to go into the cage and go fight some random guy? Yeah. <laughs> and then I go out there and submit the guy in the second round of black belt. And, uh, it's just crazy, man. It's uh, you just you never know what's like, how, how much a sport like this can change you mentally. It's like to get up there with no issues with somebody whatsoever, and someone locks the cage behind you and just say, "Bro, you gotta fight," and you just gotta go. Um, it's been a crazy ride to go from that to where I'm at now, where I can actually relax and be calm about it. And I think she's kind of had the same, uh, little bit of a development in her her persona and attitude towards the whole thing. How do you keep your composure in there? I mean, I mean, you're a veteran now, so you've been in that cage a million times. But, I mean, how do you keep the butterflies out? I noticed, like, Cowboy Cerrone says that he still gets those crazy jitters when he walks to that cage. Do you still have the same jitters, or do you have a, a routine that you go through that you can shake that? Oh, I 100% do. I think the only fight that I happen to not have the least nervous I've ever been for a fight was the Marlon Moraes fight, mm -hmm. um, believe it or not. And uh, I think I probably went out there a little too relaxed um, in terms of, like, you know, normally I feel like when you're nervous, like you're super nervous, that you're nervous. Oh, you're super chat. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> is your girl black or Mexican or a mix of the two? Okay, so Vaca in the chat wants to know if your girl is black or Mexican or a mix of the two. I don't know what kind of question. El Salvador. All right, Salvadorian. There you go. Thank you, Vodka, for the donation. I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. Anyway, go back. So you're saying, uh, we'll just back up for a second. You're saying the Marlon Moraes fight, you were the, the calmest you've ever been walking into the cage. Yeah, I, I think when you when you have those nerves and you're a little bit more on edge, you just react a little bit better. Your, your reaction time is a lot sharper. Your, everything, like your self-defense and survival mode, just instincts just go to a brand new height. It's like it's, it's similar to training, but not the same. It's mm. you almost feel like your back's really against the wall, and it's you or him. And the one time I didn't really feel that energy and didn't feel completely like that on edge was the Marlon Marais fight. I don't know that I don't think that had anything to do with it, anything at all. To be honest, I think once he hit me, I kind of realized uh, it was time to time to fight. But um, you know. Obviously, we we saw the results of that, but I just got so anxious from almost getting that that triangle to the arm bar. That as soon as I got up, I just wanted to get that fight back to the ground. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna submit this guy in the first round, and he's he's scared of the ground game, and and that was all those thoughts just going through my mind. I ran in, just shot in with no setup, and it completely just killed me. I think that's probably the lack of uh, not having those nerves. Because if I think if I was a little bit more nervous, I think I would have been a little bit more cautious and taking my time and just been a little bit more patient which um helped get me to where i am today a lot of people used to complain about my face say oh they're boring he just takes guys down he doesn't throw any punches i'm like well if i'm not throwing any punches and i'm only throwing kicks and the guy can't beat me and i'm limiting my attack then how much must the other guy really suck because if i'm not doing crap and i'm winning and finishing people then these guys just must be really bad in, in a fist fight so i don't know whatever yeah. It's got to be incredibly frustrating. Like, you know, I have this argument a lot with viewers, and we talk about, say, for instance, Kimura Usman, right? We bring him up, and people are like, he's boring, 
Right. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, what is going, what is, what do people want to watch? Like then go watch boxing or something. I don't know what you're, what you're trying. This is mixed martial arts, right? What do you have to say to these people that keep on saying stupid shit like this? It's, it's, it's really just don't watch. If, if you, if it's that boring, really don't watch. Like what else do you want to, I don't, I don't get what you come here to watch. You, you, this is not a rock'em sock'em robot old age UFC anymore. It's, you know, actual guys that know what they're doing and they're actually skilled. And because guys are actually blocking with their arms and, you know, moving out of the way from attacks, it's considered boring. They like the guys who sit there and block punches with their face. I, I, um, I like my nose where it is. I rather not have my nose plastered on the other side of my face. So <laughs> if you're not willing to go out there and do that for, for a couple of thousands of dollars, which is like, you know, they're probably making the same amount of pay as, as some of us. Um, I, I think it's cool to have my face, my face and my nose and my <laughs> facial structure intact. So I don't know, man, I Carl Usman knocked somebody out. He knocked out that guy, Sergio Moraes and people are still complaining about him. Um, I don't know what I don't know what else you gotta do. If the yeah. guy is laying on somebody, he's doing absolutely nothing. I could be like, okay, this particular fight is boring. Mm -hmm. But if the guy on bottom is not doing anything to get up, he's not throwing elbows from his back. He's not trying to get to the cage or give up his back to give up a position to give to ch to change the outcome of the fight. Then you can't really blame the guy who's getting his hand raised. It's like what people used to say about GSP. GSP was just so good that. I don't know. People still loved him. They still watched him, even though he did the same exact thing. Do a jab, power double, take you down, and lay in your guard, and probably do a five to ten punches for the rest of the round. So, and he's still considered one of the greatest of all time. Sure. We're live with Al Jermaine Sterling on the MMA Holes, and he has a YouTube channel. Make sure you go subscribe. It's Funkmaster MMA. Uh, Jesse, our moderator, if you can grab his channel, spam the shit out of it, and let's get him at least to 1,100 <laughs> subscribers, for God's sakes. What are you guys waiting for over here? You have a big fight coming up, uh, UFC AC. It's uh, against uh, Brett Johns. And, uh, okay, they're throwing you another badass it's crazy now before we get to that fight i do want to talk about this Moraes thing that i want to touch base on this because you were on a two-fight win streak okay um you must have been super confident especially going against uh, uh renan barrow and not only did you beat him you beat him convincingly <laughs> that fight which uh, some people were shocked i mean i don't know i mean i think that was a huge win for you coming off of that i could understand how you could have the confidence coming into the Moraes fight and now you see this guy Moraes, and this guy seems to be the real deal apparently um explain this yeah. walk me through this fight here i mean it was i don't know how to how to say it but it was it was fucking vicious it was absolutely vicious um to to yeah. experience like it looked like I, it looked like i died in there it yeah. did look like i died i probably watched that replay probably 200 times but yeah, yeah. so how how well, how do you it wasn't good how do you come back from something like that i mean now yeah it did i mean you must it must have been painless right it must have been an instant boom you're out like i mean that was so fast how does this happen? You think everything's going fine, and and yeah, I mean your girlfriend's next to you. I mean, let's let's hear her side of the story on this. Her being in the, oh. were you in the crowd for this? No, she didn't come out. She wasn't able to get off for uh, for work for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a busy time for December. She's a makeup artist. Oh, okay. Was she planning your funeral or something like that? How does it, how did this work? What was she, <laughs> <laughs> what was she, what was pretty, she doing? Pretty much, she she gave me the breakdown of how, like she watched it at her brother's house over in Queens. And they had like a whole big crowd and they said, everyone's like pumped up watching the fight. And then that happened and everyone just went, the room just went silent. Mm -hmm. And then they all just kind of turned and just looked at her. Oh my and God. It was just kind of like just all eyes on her at that moment kind of thing. But it must be. Yeah. It was, it was painless. Um, yeah. I mean, I, this is the thing now you, you wake up from this, right? And what is the first thing that goes through your mind? I mean, uh, you, you realize what happens. What is going through your mind here? How the fuck did I get caught? I want to see what happened. Like, what's the first thing that jumped into your head after this happened? Oh, uh, the first thing, you know, I actually came to where I wasn't like delirious. I asked them the same questions over and over in the hospital. And then my brother was asking me questions and then he was like, I started getting mad. Hmm. And then he realized I was back. He's like, all right, he's getting mad. So, <laughs> This is the real him. He's being serious all over again. Um, Cause usually I'm like pretty serious when it comes to him and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I was like, dude, I remember everything that happened. I just made one mistake and I told him everything that I walked through the entire fight. He was like, bro, I don't know how you remember all that. Some of that I even forgot. I was like, yeah, I remember every single thing, every decision I made. 
I felt like I was so in the moment that I was not in the moment. And it might be a hard thing to explain, but it goes back to what I was saying about the nerves and everything. Mm. I was just super calm where I was like, I was living in the moment, but I wasn't in that moment where for, for what it was, which is an actual fight. I wasn't in the moment to, I wasn't in fight mode. Like I wasn't programmed. My, my kill instinct and survival instincts weren't, weren't turned on yet. But yeah, I remember everything when I woke up and, uh, I told him I saw the knee and I realized at that moment I effed up big time. Yeah. <laughs> but well, that was, that was, uh, yeah, that was it. So I'm assuming there was no after party after that. That was, there was, it was just, let's go to the doctor and get the hell out of here. No, nah, everything closed early over there anyway. And, and I wasn't going to go drinking anyway. Cause yeah. I, I wanted to make sure I didn't have any headaches, which was weird. I didn't have any headaches like that night, uh, the very next day, no, like, vertigo or nothing it was the most it was the strangest things i was like maybe it's just one of those things you like you turn around in the street and somebody runs up behind you and just clocks you in the chin and then you just wake up it just catches you off guard but it's just one of those one of those kind of things my jaw wasn't broken nothing thank god and uh that was that was pretty much it with that we're live with Aljamain Sterling, uh, the funk master on the MMA holes. Now it's time for the comeback. I mean, now you seem like you have this new energy. Every time I watch clips of you online or whatever, it seems like you have these high spirits. You, you, you look better than ever. You look like you're in fantastic shape. And now they throw this guy, Brett Johns, at you uh, in, in Atlantic City. Big. This is a big card if you really think about it. I mean, I don't know when the last time the UFC was in Atlantic City, but this is a big deal. And you're on the East Coast. I'm sure you're going to have some family over there. Uh, everyone begging you for tickets for this fight? Uh, yeah, but p I have to keep reminding people that I don't sell tickets. <laughs> I get like, they give me like a, a, a voucher for like family and friends. And if they apply early, they can get like seats, like together kind of thing for the Sarah Longo, uh, fight supporters, that kind of thing. Mm. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited for this. Uh, I got two names, Cody Stammen and Brett Johns. I say, you know what? I want to fight the guy who's ranked. I want to fight the guy, uh, who's supposed to be the next big thing. I, I said, I, I want the tougher fight. And I figured Cody Stammen kind of just throws off one-off punches and backs up. And Brett Johns kind of very simple with his striking and shoots a lot. He shoots a lot to the same side. And I was like, if this looks like the tougher fight, he's going to be looking to tr tr try to drag this fight to the ground the entire time. And uh, I, think, I think there's a couple of ways his mindset could probably be like, He's probably thinking either I want to test his chin mm. because obviously the last my the, the result of my last fight that could be one way he wants to play it, or he's going to be looking to want to just take this fight down to the ground um, as much as possible because I think I'm the longer rangier fighter. I think I fight longer than him. I think it's going to frustrate him, cause a lot of problems. And uh, once I find my openings to start tattooing him on the feet, I think um, he's going to get a little bit more desperate for those for those takedown attempts, and I think he's going to present himself. Uh, an opportunity for me to, to snatch up his neck and uh, secure the finish. That's interesting. So they, they proposed Cody Stamen first, who is uh, another uh, interesting fighter that's coming up right now, young guy. And and you chose Brett Johns. That's interesting. So you're just are you doing this for yourself as a challenge for yourself, or you just rather prefer to fight a ranked guy? Um, Brett Johns coming off, what is he got three wins in a row over here, uh, two unanimous decisions. And he has it and the calf like, slice. Yeah, and he does have that finish, that submission uh, in the first round over here. So yeah, he's he's a serious uh, threat over here. Now, okay, fighting a guy that's that's under under you right now. Does this add more fire to to your uh, your your camp right now? Are you like more pumped up, ready to go with this guy because he is a lower ranked guy? You have something to prove now, after, especially after a finish like the last fight. Uh, like, how do you go into a training camp like this? I think go about it the pretty much the same way. I keep everything in perspective. That last fight was not what Mar Marlon did; is more so what I did wrong on mm -hmm. a technical standpoint. And I I paid the ultimate price in this sport, which is being separated from your consciousness. Um, that's that's pretty much what it is. And you got to just keep those things in perspective. Otherwise, it'll just keep eating at you, and you'll keep thinking, "Oh, this was wrong. Oh, that was wrong." I'm like, there's nothing my coach did from holding pads to running the workouts, the puke drill and all kinds of things and running us through sprints and sl and uh, the, the treadmill uh, sprints and things like that, that made me make that decision on that night. It had nothing to do with that and it had everything to do with me. And that's what it comes down to. When you start taking responsibility for your own actions and things that you can control, good things start to happen. And that's what I realized in college wrestling. That's what I realized in the beginning of my MMA career. That's what I realized when I got to the UFC. 
And uh, the same thing with the Caraway and the Sun South fight. You know, I could keep blaming other people and the judges for this and that. But with each loss, I, I learned something new about myself, about the sport, and how to tweak certain things in my game so that I can be more at an ad advantage in the future fights. I think this is going to come down to the same thing. You know, I think my Burrell fight, my Augusto Mendes fight showed the skill set that I really do have on the ground. I can scramble with anybody. I can grapple with the best guys in the world, which I do on a daily basis over at Henzo Gracie's and Sarah BJJ. Um, these guys are competing with the guys in the death squad. And, I, you know, I'm training with these guys, you know, so I, I can't really see, I'm not saying I'm just training with these guys. I'm competing with these guys. I think that's the big difference. Yeah. You can train with them, but are you competing with them? And I think that's the big difference. Um, my wrestling pedigree, I think that speaks for itself. Um, I think people start to see more of my stand up capabilities whenever I'm willing to engage and the Augusto fight, the, uh, Brawl fight, Brawl fought his last fight. He just lost and people were saying, Oh, it's, is post USADA. USADA got to him. I'm like, if you look at the techniques Browse has thrown in his last two fights with myself and with Brian Kelleher and with TJ Dillashaw, it's all been the same stuff. It's just the game has caught up with him. And I even mm -hmm. said it back then. I was like, I think I have the perfect style to be him. Footwork, movement, lateral movement, don't stand in front of him, use a lot of feints. And that's what I did. And I think um, if anybody for him, the cleanest was probably me. I think I took the least amount of damage from Brow out of all the guys he fought in the past, his past six fights. And I think that says something, that says a lot. Um, and, and that's it, man, that's all you can do. Keep everything in perspective and just keep building for with, with every single fight. It's like anything in life. You let one little thing weigh you down and you start pointing the finger at all these other people instead of looking at the ultimate person who makes those decisions, it's you. Mm. So you gotta be real with yourself if you want real results. And uh, April 21st, I think if people have been following my my training series, uh, UFC Road to Redemption, people are going to see uh, the same Al Jermaine's still hungry, still a contender. And I'm going to prove that Brett Johns is, a real, is still a serious threat to the division. But at this point in time, I think it's too much too soon. Um, I think the Soto he fought is not the Soto of, of two years ago. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go out there and prove that. That's right. We're live with Al Jermaine Sterling, the Funk Master. Funk Master. You're going to wrap one on Whoa. one shoulder? Holy shit, someone's, and you're gonna need someone's a fucking army to come take them belts off me. All right, let's see what we got here. I hate to interrupt. I just wanted to say love you guys and Sterling looks and sounds like. All right, so here we go. T-Man. T-Man says uh, love you guys and uh, Sterling looks and sounds like a beast. So there you go. Now, T-Man is a friend of the show. He's a DJ. And uh, he's not familiar with MMA, but we're trying to drag him into this world of mixed martial, martial arts. What would you say to someone that doesn't know much about the sport. Why should they watch the UFC? Why should you watch the UFC? I'm going to say if you want to see the true form of competition, you know, and you want to see what someone's really made of, this is a sport to watch. You know, you go watch basketball, you can watch soccer and football, and you can see these guys flopping all over the place just to get a foul. There are no fouls in this sport. This is... You're going out there, mano a mano, and you're just going to see who the better uh, man or woman is that night, and that's pretty much what it comes down to. Uh, I think some of the UFC fighters are some of the top athletes in the world in terms of they can cross over to other sports and have not the same amount of success as those pro-level athletes, but can compete in those sports in terms of their athletic abilities. To be able to do the things that a lot of these guys in, these, in the sport of MMA do, just do in general, I think is extremely hard, extremely difficult, and is a testament to like just the the person, the type of person that they are in terms of dedication to the to the craft and just wanting to become better overall. So, Al Jermaine, I have to know about this now. You were speaking about Burrell before, and uh, that was probably to me one of your most impressive fights over there. Uh, Burrell at one point was unbeatable. Like people thought that this guy was not going to lose, right? Uh, TJ yeah. came and did his thing, but yeah, you were super impressive against Burrell. And the thing, the cloud, the big dark cloud that holds over, that hangs over the UFC is steroids, right? Uh, I've noticed that you have been very vocal. I've noticed uh, Weidman, uh, Iakinta, everyone's been vocal about this, and rightfully so. I mean, people are using these steroids and stuff like that, getting popped, this and that. And some people on top of the, the food chain, like John Jones, for instance, keeps on getting trouble with this. What are your thoughts on steroids and mixed martial arts, and how can they clean this up? I have one... My I have one thought process on that. If you're using steroids, you're just mentally weak. 
And if you're if you feel like you need to revert to that in order to win, like if you feel like you truly need that to win, you already lost the fight. Um, so once you get caught and you can't fight, you can't make money. They, you know, they say cheaters. If you're not cheating, you're not trying, I guess. But uh, you know what? You're gonna pay for it at some point, and it, it's gonna catch up to you. Whether if it's not in the sport now, when you retire and all the side effects and everything catches up to you, I hope it was worth it. You know, I hope you made enough money to the point where it was worth it because the damage you're gonna cause yourself and your body for the future just is not. It doesn't make an, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I think it's criminal, man. You to go out there in an already dangerous sport. Um, some people might be a little bit more timid, but if you're if you're on the juice, it can automatically just boost that that extra. I don't know the right terminology for it, but it gives you a little bit more of that fighting spirit in terms of the you become a little bit more violent, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, more willing to do stuff, take risks, almost like the Vitor Belfort, the v Vitor Belfort off the sauce and the Vitor Belfort on the sauce, two completely different animals. I think that's the best way to even um, compare it in, in terms of comparison to let people know like what, what I'm trying to say. Uh, you got the timid Vitor who goes out there, he doesn't have that same pop and doesn't have that same killer instinct compared to the Vitor Belfort when he's on the sauce and he's still confident and he knows if he touches you and he just swings, he's going to put you down. It's a, it's a completely different animal night and day. We got another subscriber. Look, you're bringing in the views. Speaking of subscribers, make sure you subscribe to Al Jermaine Sterling. He's at 1,057. So we got a couple of peeps going over there. Go over to that channel, rate his channel, subscribe to the uh, future bantamweight champion of the world, Al Jermaine Sterling, the Funk Master. That's right. Uh, have you prepared what you're going to do when you have that strap around your waist and you rise back up the rankings? What, what are you going to do? What's the first thing you're going to buy? First thing I'm going to buy, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to buy anything. I'm going to take my victory lap travel a little bit and uh you know i'm into i'm into wrestling i like coaching kids i coach at bowling high school you know it's a sport that kind of gave me this platform and helped start everything it was like catalyst and all and, and all my success so uh i learned that through wrestling if you can wrestle through four years of high school four years of college everything in life is easy there's nothing that's going to be harder than that that grind every day waking up for practice doing two a days lifting in the morning at 6 a.m and having to be there in that morning lift two times a week, running sprints, hill sprints, and things like that. It's, just, it's, a, it's a whole different animal, man. And it, it, I think that really helped mold my mindset. And that's why when I go out there, I, I truly do feel like, you know, I, I have a, a mantra that I always say to myself. It's, uh, I'm too strong, too quick, too tough, and I can't do it. And, and, I, and that's, that's, that's what I truly believe in. I go out there and I feel those things. I know, if, you know, he throws a punch. The same thing I feel is the same thing he's going to feel. And he's going to need a whole lot of that in order to, to put me out. So you, you got to put me out in order to, to get me out of here. Because other than that, there's, there's going to be no quit. I'm going to find a way to win. And that, that's just what it is. It's just that wrestling mentality. You, you figure it out. You're down 20 seconds. You're down a few points. You got to go big. And you got to, you know, if you want to get your hand raised at the end of that match. And, and that's what it comes down to. Being able to take risks. Being able to go after it. And, and just digging deep. Al Jermaine Sterling has a big fight. UFC Atlantic City, Saturday, April 21st, 2018. It's coming right around the corner. It's the Barboza versus Lee card. Um, we are going weeks, over... Weeks. Oh, man, you got to be pumped up. You got to be fired up to get back into that cage. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing that. Now, what I want to do, this is the part of the show where I'm going to take some questions from the chat. So if you guys have any questions, drop them in the chat over here. I'm also going to open up the phone lines uh, and see if uh, these knuckleheads have some normal questions for you, Aljamain. Probably no, but let's we'll try it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I will say this. Um, I've been doing my vlog series. I do my own editing, that kind of thing. Um, so when you guys do check it out, there's, I do try to put some technique in there in case anyone's interested and they want to try some stuff out. Single leg takedowns off the cage, double leg takedowns off the cage, the type of different lifts that I do, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't want to give away all my secrets in one vlog. I try to spread it out, shit, so I spread the love out so that everything doesn't kind of run dry after a while. So... Um, I give a little bit away each each time, so if you guys want to check that out. That's right, Funkmaster MMA. Go give him a subscribe over there on YouTube. Are you trying to push it over to YouTube? I mean, I noticed a lot of people are doing this. We only did this show for like a year and a half, and Jesus Christ, YouTube is fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Fuck the demonetization. You can still make money over here and have fun. And are you looking to take the Sterling show to YouTube? Is that the uh, the move? That is That is the ultimate plan. Um, I don't know how the whole money thing works, uh, monetizing. I know was, they did change that, um, but that's not really why I've been doing it. I kind of just wanted to build a following and just kind of share what I what I 
what I know and some of the things that I believe in. I just got a lot going on. I think out of all the fighters in terms of um, actually having some some content that people might be willing to want to watch, I think I I have a, a good a good amount of that to, to deliver. So that's, that's pretty much what it is. So if, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, let me know you don't like it. Either way, it's all good. I'm still going to be doing it because it's what I like doing. There you go. We got 1,060 subscribers. Make sure you keep going over there. 1,061, 1,100. We're going to have a goddamn party over here. The phone lines are open, 516-522-0267. Call in. Call Aljamain Sterling. This is your chance to talk to a ranked UFC fighter over here. What are you waiting for? Call in right now. And here we go. Okay. What the fuck? You just hung up on me. That was Jose. Hopefully, Jose, call me back. Stop. Don't hang up on now, Jermaine. How dare you do it? with you, Jose. Stupid ass. <laughs> what do you do with your... Uh, oh, here we go. Kenshiro Ryu, welcome to the MMA Holes. Another New Yorker right over here. You're live with Al Jermaine Sterling. What's on your mind? Hey, uh, Al Jermaine, have you ever thought of doing a Anthony Johnson and move up to 155? That's a good question. 155. <laughs> Whoa, 155, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's a couple of weight classes. Yeah, because I, uh, I mean, I do get whenever cool. I see him like, doing the weigh-in, he looks a little bit too slim for his height. And I think his muscles yeah, are screaming for more power. You know? so I think he'll do better at 155 than 135. Okay, Paul Shiro. So he says, uh, he says he thinks that you would be better at 155. I don't know what he's saying. He's saying you'd be better at 155 maybe because you look big for your division. Maybe that's what he's saying over there. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I do my last two fights. I've been over 165, mm. um, probably within a week after weighing in. But okay. uh, I I don't carry that weight. I don't carry that weight well. Meaning, I get more bloated. I get chick monk cheeks, and once uh once I start working out, I just start to thin out really quick. So I I think it'll be a little tough. I I got a I got a small frame. I got long arms, long legs, skinny legs, but uh I got a small frame, so I can't really hold the weight well. So you're saying week of fight week, the fight week, you're walking around at 160, 165, somewhere around there? You, yeah, it, one week after. Holy shit. Oh, one week after. Okay. So, all right. So let me get this straight. So when you're cutting, what are you looking, what do you walk around as? You walk around at 165? Like right now, um, this morning I was 153. Okay. Um, Sunday I was 160. Sunday I was probably a little, honestly, probably Sunday I was probably like 64 actually, if I'm being completely honest. But um, that's what I'm saying. Like my body, the weight fluctuates so easily. It's it's kind of crazy. But I, I have one one two days of working out, and I'm back down to 53. Um, tomorrow I'll probably wake up 53, and then uh, yeah, just slowly taper down. I try to get down to like 48 on fight week, waking up around that weight, kind of get my body used to moving around and training at that weight for like two two and a half weeks. This way, when I do the weight cut and I and I put the water and everything back in, mm. I don't feel like a big shock to the body, and I can still be agile, still move, and not have a, so much of a hit. I'm gonna wrap yeah. one on one shoulder. I'm gonna wrap the other on the other shoulder. Oh, and you're gonna need a fucking army <laughs> to come take them belts this off is, me. This uh, is T-Man again. We have a DJ and three awesome MMA podcasts. I would say YouTube is officially back to the fun. There we go. All right. Days. Thanks. Thank you, T-Man, for the donation. Appreciate it. And yeah, that's right. He's a YouTube DJ coming in and yeah, he loves it. Uh, so I, I got a quick question. Uh, with the weight cutting thing, which fight was your worst weight cut? My worst weight cut in the UFC or just in general? Well, I, I guess in general would be a good an uh, answer. Well, my fight, my actually, this was my, I think my second title defense. Oh, no. Actually, this was my first title defense. Honorio was my second. Casey Johnson. Um, for that fight, that was for Cage Fury. I was six pounds overweight the day before. Um, so the day of the weigh-ins, because this is when weigh-ins were at night, like five or six, and uh, I had to lose six pounds in the sauna, and I was seeing like black circles around my eyes. Like the closer I got down, I was like one pound out, and I was, like like opening my eyes. It was like, everything was kind of dimming in. It was the scariest thing. But um, super dehydrated, my eyes were sunk in cotton mouth and I was just like yo it, it was to the point where I flexed and it hurt so bad like my rib cage and everything um and yeah man it was it was a bad weight cut that was the most I ever pulled water the most water I was able to pull and you gotta realize I'm fighting at 135 so the most weight 
for me to be pulling six pounds the day before is a lot of my body weight. That's a pretty good uh, like body percentage. If I was a heavyweight, it's completely different. But at that weight, I'm already depleted, and then cutting six pounds of water, um, it was it was pretty scary. I I didn't think I was gonna make it. That was the first time I actually thought I wasn't gonna make weight. You know, I always make weight if I you know, and then that was the one time. It was scary as hell, but I made it. I made it, and we won. What do you think about the the extra weight classes that they want to throw in between in the divisions? I think it would be good for 55 and 70 and even 205 to, to heavyweight. It's just weird because you have that big gap from 55 to 70 and some guys are in between. It's like, I think I'm in between. I could probably be fighting at 140 more comfortably than at 36 and not have to do such a crazy weight cut. But I think things are just, I don't know, it's just tough, man. Where does everybody go? Yeah. Everyone's always going to be looking for a competitive edge and like, ah, oh, I cut down and I can rehydrate and be the bigger man in there. So that's what it comes down to. There you go. All right. Opening the phone lines back up. 516-522-0267. Get in on the lines with the Funk Mask. We're going to take a couple of calls and then we'll let you go. Uh, yeah, I'm fascinated by the whole weight cut thing. I always like to ask uh, everyone, the fighters, about it because it's, it's got to like be. Yo-yo, man. It's got to be brutal. It sucks. It's got to be brutal. All right, here we go. Okay, Jose, we got you on the line live with Aljamain Sterling. What's on your mind, my friend? Hey, what's up, man? Legitimate fucking top 10 in the UFC. That's a fucking real deal killer we got right there. Good shit for getting him on the show. Um, What I wanted to talk about real quick, I just want to shout him out because, you know, he took a fucking tough loss, man. That was a nasty knockout. And people were trolling him, talking about, oh, he did the dab. And I noticed that he responded and was like, you know what? Yeah, I did do the fucking dab. So I want to give him props for being able to take that sort of negative criticism because that's a big thing, like, on YouTube is that people troll the shit out of you. And he just turned around and was just like, yup, I fucking did. So what? So that's fucking awesome. And then the other thing that I noticed from the interview, he's a very well-spoken guy. He's a very intelligent man. Does he worry now that he took that knockout about the potential long-term damage? And, you know, what's his plan for kind of making money after he gets out of fighting? Is that why he's building his YouTube channel? You know, what's kind of like, what's the retirement plan? Because, you know, he's a young man right now, but he can't fight forever. And then especially now that he's kind of experienced what a knockout feels like, what's he going to do when he retires? Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jose. That was a good question over there. Okay. So what are your response to uh, Jose over there? What was that? Being well spoken uh, after something like that, a, a knockout like that, and then you, I mean, you just another day at the office. You kind of dabbed afterwards and like, ah, it's, it's, it is what it is. Uh, how do you respond? Do you do you are you worried about you know taking hits like that, fights finishing in that way? Like, are you worried? What are you going to do in the future? How do you, what are your plans after something like that? Well, I've, I've already said in my my. Uh plans for the future. You're gonna rap one on one shoulder, <laughs> I'm gonna rap the other on the other shoulder, Hold on. and you're gonna need a fucking <laughs> army to come take them belts off me. We got Vlad here. I have a buddy in sports named Donald Sterling. Any relation? I believe he also goes by the funk master. Hashtag wall. <laughs> okay, Donald uh, Sterling, there we go. No, All right. re- no relation. <laughs> but, uh, that, no, that, uh, thank you to that last guy. That was cool. That was, uh, that's cool to hear. Um, you know what, man, it goes back to that, what I was saying before, people are going to say what they want to say. And, and you know, I did do the dab, you know, I looked at it. I was like, eh, people got a point here. It, it does look like dab and <laughs> it is what it is. there's no, uh, there's no denying that someone else just got knocked out like that too, man. I felt so bad. I, I wrote about it on Twitter. I was like, good to see I'm not alone. And I was like, yo, take it. Like, I forgot what I said, but I try to give him like, keep his spirits up about it. like, bro, it can happen to anybody. He's like, even the best of us, man. Sometimes we just we just make a bad mistake, and instead of zigging, you should have zagged, and you just get caught. And who's who knows, man? That could actually happen again. What are the odds of that happening again in my next fight? Very slim in terms of me actually making that mistake again. But it can happen again in terms of being knocked out. It's just one of those things. Like you 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 hop in that cage, you sign the dotted line, you know what you sign up for. The possibilities are endless, and this is why this is one of the best sports because you just never know. What's going to happen? Yawan, Jacek, Rose Namajunas, uh, Cody and TJ, uh, Anson Silva, Chris Wyman, Max Serra, GSP. You just never know. And that's why you, that's why you fight. You could, you could talk about it all day until you guys actually go in there and settle it. Who's going to be better on that night? You don't know who's dealing with what in their personal life. 
and all that type of things. It could just be an off night. And sometimes those things happen. And if you make that walk, you better be okay with the consequences. I bet one of the best people to talk to was Chris Weidman after something like that, because with him, with Yo Romero, I mean, he experienced something very similar. I mean, it was pretty nasty what happened to him over there. What was his advice after you came off of uh, the Maria fight? Well, we, we, we talked about it at length. Me, him, Volante, uh, Matt Serra, um, and even I, Quinta, I think the only person who hasn't uh, ever had to deal with that, uh, Jinx knocking wood, is uh, I, Quinta. But um, it's just one of those things. Uh, Al, I, Al actually thought I was coming back too soon. But the thing about it was he didn't, he didn't understand what I was trying to do. We were actually roommates. So then when I broke it down to him, it, it, he kind of he kind of got it. Uh, I was like, yeah, I'm training, but I'm not sparring. I, my first sparring session was actually last week, and I probably took two punches in terms of, like, jabs. Mm. So it just goes to show you, like, the way I train the, and the way I compete, I take very little damage. So that I guess that knee makes up for all the times I've hit everybody in training and not ever been hit. So I guess that kind of makes up for all that. But, uh, yeah, we Chris and I spoke about it, Volante and I. It just came down to, like, are you having symptoms? And I had to be honest. I, I told him, I was like, being, I'm being completely honest. I had, didn't have any headaches, nothing, no side effects, no throwing up, no nausea, no vertigo. And, uh, you know, one time I actually did, I was knocked out before and uh, I had vertigo pretty bad. And I took, I think, like three months off, like no contact, nothing. And uh, the vertigo symptoms were lasting for almost a month. And I was scared, man. I thought I was going to have that whole TJ Grant thing and uh, Chris Hallsworth. And I thought I was going to be, I thought my career was done. Yeah. And I was like, it just sucks because I never got the chance to make my run for the UFC title and uh, get my actual title shot to see if, you know, I could truly win the belt or not. And, but, you know, I got past that. I won my next two fights. And then this happened with Marlon and just came back to that. And Chris and I talked about it, Volante. And uh, they, they same thing they said, like, don't spar, train, get in the best shape of your life. And that's how I feel right now. I feel like I'm in the best physical shape of my life. And uh, I feel strong, man. This is the most I've lifted. Since the beginning of my career, my beginning of my UFC career, and I just couldn't deal with the weight cut because I eat a lot of chocolate. I eat a lot of candy, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah. And um, I got better with my diet. And now that I got more discipline with my diet, I'm controlling it better. I'm lifting more. I feel stronger. And I'm training jiu-jitsu. I'm training wrestling. I'm picking guys up through the air. They, I'm shooting in on those takedowns. If they're defending, they're going to Kimura locks. They're getting cross faces. I step in. I use my legs. And I'm hor- I'm sending them flying first class. So I'm, I'm excited, man. I feel good. I feel powerful. As Matt Sarah would say, TRT Sarah, I feel powerful. <laughs> That's how I feel right now. Oh, we're live with the Funk Master here, Aljamain Sterling. And here is his Instagram. I'm showing Funk Master underscore UFC. You look to be in the best shape of your life right now. Now, they're talking about what's life after the UFC. You're 28 years old. Do you feel that this is your last run? Like, where do you feel like in your career? And then where? what is life after mixed martial arts? Well, I fought four times last year. I'm hoping I could fight that many times this year as long as, you know, I can stay healthy and, and not get banged up. I, my timetable is 32, you know, but if the money is really good and the competition makes sense, depending on how my body is feeling four years from now, um, maybe I can stick around a little bit longer and just fight when, you know, the time is right. But I, I'm working on different avenues, working on my exit strategies, just so when I'm done, I don't fall flat on my face. I mean, I got a college degree. I can always fall back on that. But uh, after the life of being a fighter and seeing the world, I don't know if I can sit in a classroom all day and, and just teach. It's a great job, don't get me wrong, especially in New York, Long Island. These teachers get paid out the bank. These teachers, some of these teachers are clearing 120 k plus for being phys ed or whatever they're teaching, you know? So I could have been set pretty well off, even right now if I wanted to. But, you know, I'm chasing a dream, chasing a passion. I think that's what life's about, living out your living out your your your, your dream life and, and you're gonna rap one on one shoulder and you're gonna rap the other on the other shoulder and you're gonna you need a <laughs> fucking army <laughs> to come take them belts off me all right frank Vaughn has he ever made a fighter shit their pants this is a great question have you ever made a fighter shit their pants al Jermaine sterling i'm sure you got asked this all the time right I made him. I made him rip ass. If that's if that counts, a couple times. Oh my God. That's, I'm telling you, man. That's that squeeze is no joke. 
I tell you what, you know, it's funny, like every fighter we've had on here, we've always had the shit jokes and stuff like that. But I mean, I guess it's part of the sport. Like, I mean, listen, we're human beings, for God's sakes. You're in a cage. You're fighting for your life in there. You know, things happen. Wh- who is the wor- be honest with me? You, no one's watching this. <clears throat> of course, no one's watching this. Uh, but who is the smelliest <laughs> fighter you have ever fought? I need to know right now in the MMA holes. Who is the smelliest person you've ever fought? The smelliest person? You got to call him out right now. You know what, man? I think, thank God I've been fortunate to not have to fight any smelly people. I've wrestled smelly people, and you just want to get off the mat where you you smell your hand. You're like, oh, I can't believe he grabbed my wrist for that long. Just, you know, but never, no one, never, you know, and I always go out there before I fight, I always shower. I'm like, I'm like that. And even after the fight, I shower, I'm like, I, I don't want to be that guy that just smells like complete crap. And people are like, oh, I want him to, I, I want to be uncomfortable. I'm like, no, it's just freaking gross, man. <laughs> Take a shower. Take a shower. Is it a strategy? I mean, I mean, would it be a strategy? Some may argue and say, hey, might as well come in there stinking. If I get on top of someone, they'll just pass out from me stinking. It's so stupid. It's so- <laughs> No, you just you just smell, and hopefully yeah. you get your you get your ass kicked. How about that? <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, we're gonna take one more call. I'm gonna open the phone lines up. I have a million questions for you, but we, and listen, we can't talk to you all night. One more call: five one six five two two zero two six seven. Aljamain Sterling has a huge fight over here, UFC AC. It's gonna be going down against Brett Johns. This is gonna be fireworks over here. Do you have any predictions for this fight? Who me? Yes. I don't know how I'm going to win, but I know I'm going to slay a dragon on April 21st. Why should people tune into this fight, Aljamain versus Brett Johns? Why should people tune in? I think you got two high-level grapplers. Uh, Brett Johns undefeated 15-0, thinks it's his time, 3-0 in the UFC. I remember being that young gun once, and uh, I'm ready to put his fire out and show the world that I'm still one of the top fighters in this division, and I'm a threat to that throne, so... April 21st, make sure you guys tune in. And plus, it's free, of course. So you better tune in. Free. That. Free is for me. All right. Last call. <laughs> 773, you're live with Aljamain Sterling. What's your name and what's your question, my man? This is Bobby. Hey, Aljo, did you ever see Did you see the uh, Joe Rogan podcast today with Pat Militich? And I want to know what he thinks of the older fighters who paved the way. Okay, there you go. Thanks for the call. All right, so first wants to know if you've seen the Pat Militich on Joe Rogan. Do you watch Joe Rogan? Uh, not often. I do watch the guys of interest, like Jan- John Danaher. Um, there was another guy, um, not Kugler, the guy that, who ran, like, the marathon, the, the Marine guy who failed, like, a couple times. Crazy inspirational story. I forget his name, though. Um, I probably only heard a handful of Joe Rogan's uh, stuff. It's just so long, mm-hmm. and I'm, like, doing a hundred things every single day, but I know who Pat Millich is. is and I'm gonna have to check that out now. If someone recommends one, I always check it out. Yeah. Um, and what I think about the the fighters in the past history, man, they they paved the way. They are the p- true pioneers of the sport. They're the reason why the sport is where it is today. And a couple of years from now, my position is going to be not saying just me, just my position. The guys who came in at this era is going to be the the guys who paved the way for the newer guys who are coming up. Those new younger guys, those like even that kid from uh, the contender contender series, uh, Benito Lopez. Those guys who were 20, 21 years old. Those are going to be the guys that we paved the way for, and they're going to have a better platform to fight for where they're making more money and things like that. So, you know, thank thank, thank God we had those guys um, so that we could be blessed to do what we do now and actually can make a living doing this and not have to work two jobs. You know, it took me a while to, to work and fight at the same time. And then when I was able to make enough money, when I went on my 4-0 run, that's when I was able to walk away from my substituting job and just coach, train full time. So thank you guys, you pioneers, Pat Militage, all you guys, Frank Trigg, everybody, Mark Coleman, and uh, Sakuraba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, legends right there. Uh, Frank, ba- Frank Bavon in the chat has a very, very important question. Wants to know, do you play Fortnite on PS4 or Xbox? I've been, I've been hearing about this Fortnite crave, <laughs> craze for uh, so long now, so many days now. But I don't own a system anymore because if I did have it, I probably want to train, and that's the honest to God truth. Why I do not have a system. <laughs> um, uh, I I was that way. I was bad in college, at, where I had to stop going to my to my to my roommate's dorm to to play because I would leave my house, drive to his dorm, and sit there and miss. Sometimes I would miss class to play video games. It was the stupidest thing playing Halo and Call of Duty all day. Um, but uh, yeah, 
That's why I don't have a video game system. So hopefully, I don't want to deal with that. You know, there's a yeah. lot of things I got to get done and I'm working on. So when I'm done and retired, hopefully I can get the newest, latest system and sit in front of the TV if I set myself up the right way. So I, I can't enjoy those luxuries yet. I think to be able to sit home and play video games is a pretty good luxury where you're pretty good with where you are in life. Or you just... You just need to get your life together. Yeah. One of the, one of the other. <laughs> it's probably the second of the two. I um, I got sucked into the Fortnite. I have a second channel, and I play this game. This game I play for hours, and it's like I get nothing accomplished. I just sit there and play with twelve year olds online. It's ridiculous. I and need you're to like, stop. where does the time go? Oh, it's where so stupid. Uh, what is it like having yourself in? That's Alexa talking right now. Alexa, stop. Jesus Christ, I'm having an interview right now. Anyway, uh, what is it like having a uh, yourself in a video game? The UFC 3 is out right now, and now you can beat people up as yourself. What is it like to be in a video game? It's pretty sick. The only thing that sucks about it, if, if I play with my own character and then get in, I get my ass kicked by these 12-year-olds that you were talking about, these guys are so good at the video game. I'm over here trying to play like it's real life. Like I'm going to jab, and then I'm going to block and counter and take you down, and then I just get reversed and choked out. And so it's not very fun. I'd rather watch those kids play with me and send me video clips on Snapchat, Instagram. Like, yeah, I, just look at me. Um, these Someone actually tweeted to me the other day. They're like, oh, this guy's salty. And I've just been kicking everyone's ass online. I'm like, yes. <laughs> like that. It's, it's pretty cool, man. It's surreal. I never ever thought I'd ever see the day that I was in a video game. Even when I got to the UFC, I never thought there was ever going to be a UFC game. And three, uh, three generations in. So hopefully they keep that going. And... You know, God willing, I'm still around when they keep putting out the new ones. So, Khabib or Tony? Who do you have in UFC 223? Now, you Tony fans, don't get mad at me, but Khabib time. And I have a very good argument for this. Tony is very good off of his back. But you have to be in Tony's guard to be very, to be caught by Tony's submissions, in my opinion. I don't think he's going to Imanari roll, Baron Bolo roll, or any of that stuff against Khabib. Khabib's going to take him down against the cage, press him against the cage, have his neck cranked against the cage where he's not going to pay to move, and it's just not going to be good. And if he goes for a submission, try and go for an arm bar or a triangle, Khabib's going to rip his arm out and continue to ground and pound, control the waist. Tony's a very good wrestler, but if he submits... You're going to wrap one on one shoulder? I'm going to wrap you on the other shoulder? <laughs> and you're going to need a fucking army! We got another donation coming in here. Hold on a second. With this newfound celebrity fighting for the UFC, how are you planning to fight off all the the black mods, kryptonite, white girls? What the fuck? The oh, so they want to know what all this celebrity? How are you gonna fight off the black man's kryptonite, white girls? I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> That's well, actually a question right there. I don't know how you want to respond to that. <laughs> um, I yeah. like. <laughs> what a question you know, that's, how I, that's how I fight it all <laughs> You don't see that on Ariel Hawani I'll tell you that right now You're not going to see that on Ariel Oh my god Anyway <laughs> I don't know what the fuck happened Anyway uh, I noticed with, uh, with Khabib time. Time. Yeah wait, well real quick Ally Akinta I noticed on uh, Ariel's show Said they have to pay me a lot of money to fight this man Like this is a man in the division He says you have to pay me a lot of money to fight uh, Nurmaga Madoff. I mean, this guy is the real deal, right? What are, what are your thoughts on this guy? I mean, 100 percent. You got to think about it. Edson Barboza is a world class striker, world class Muay Thai fighter. If he's ripping those leg kicks, ripping those body kicks, and Khabib is just checking them, taking them on the form, and those do not feel good. I tell you, if you, I don't know if you ever taken a Muay Thai class and had a guy just through the through the shields, the tie pads when they're ripping those kicks uh, uh, from a good fighter, throwing those kicks through the pads, you're gonna feel it. Now, imagine those crushing into your forearms a couple of times, your rib cage. Khabib's walking through it, hands up high, just goes blitzkrieg, throws him a couple of punch combinations, diving in on the legs, your back hits the cage, and then he's dragging you to the mat. That's not a fun 15 minutes, and that cannot be a fun 25 minutes. I don't care who you are. You, I don't think Barbosa could have fought a better fight, in my opinion. Like, if they had a rematch... What does Barbosa do differently? You know what I mean? Hope that mm -hmm. one of those spinning wheel kicks connect because I, I don't know. I think in order to beat a guy like that, you have to catch him clean on the chin and it has to be a stand-up strike. That's that's my personal opinion. Um, you're throwing kicks and you're leaning backwards and all your weight's on one foot and your back against is, is, ends up against the cage. You can't really effectively throw those kicks because there's no room for you to clear your hips 
and to lean back and get that range. So I just think uh, stylistically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a very good boxer with very good takedown defense that can beat a guy like Khabib. And uh, I think I was right. Like, if he was in my division, like, if he was the champ, I would be not very happy. <laughs> I would not be very happy. I'll tell you that. And um, honestly, I think I could be that Khabib type of fighter. I think I show my ground and pound could be very vicious with those elbows. Um, and when I take guys down, I'm pretty relentless when I'm chasing, pursuing that takedown, especially against the cage. I'm excited for April 21st. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited uh, about it. That's right. April I'm excited for April 7th for Ally Quinta, and I'm excited for Khabib time. I think Al it's going to be a sick fight. Raging Al's on to what? The UFC 223. You're following not too uh, far after with uh, UFC AC. I mean, you guys got to be in each other's corner going crazy, you know, for each other. <clears throat> I mean, it's got to be yep. like this brotherly bond that you guys have over there. What's it like watching you know, your, you know, your brother in the cage go at it? I mean, you got to be going nuts in the seats. Yeah, yeah. You, you almost get more nervous for them than you do for yourself, which is kind of crazy. I know a lot of people say that's kind of cliche at this point, but it's a hundred percent the truth, you know, because you're you're in there and you're from the you're in the back row and you're like, ah, oh, you should have did this, you could have did this, oh, that was open. Ah, oh, I see you do this before, you could have caught him with this. And it's a crazy, crazy, crazy feeling. But uh, I'm confident in my boys and, and what they do and the work they put in. So it's always exciting to watch them go out there and, and chase their dreams, chase their goals, and uh, go out there and get their hands raised after putting in eight, ten weeks of hard work in a training camp. Al Jermaine Sterling has a huge fight April 21st. Atlantic City versus Brett Johns, number eight, number number 14, number eight. It's going to be going down. Uh, Barboza versus Lee. It's going to be a this, – this is a stacked card over here. Uh, Branch versus Santos. Miller versus Hooker. Uh, LaFleur's on the card as well. I mean, this card is just loaded up. Atlantic City. Uh, and Edgar versus Swanson. Is this legit? Is this coming on your card now too? Yeah, it is. Uh, but we got it uh... – a whole lot of strong island stud muffins that are going to be raiding Atlantic City. I, I'm excited for that. Who's someone else to look out for on this card? I mean, LaFleur, if I'm not mistaken, is from Long Island, correct? Yep. Yes, he is. Um, and uh, Miller's from Jersey. Uh, I see. I think Corey Anderson's from New York, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, people. Corey, Corey Anderson is from, I forget where he's from. I know he wrestled at University of Whitewater mm -hmm. when we were both in D3. Um, and then he ended up on the show train with mark henry i think he just moved out to jersey to train with those guys full time there you go Corey anderson's known for his weird nipples what do you think about Corey anderson's nipples be honest uh, <laughs> you know what i'm talking about what's up with those nipples they, they're very uh, weird i don't know what's wrong with them <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right I, at least you know what i'm talking about here i mean i i, I can't stop looking I, I don't know what it is i'm like there's something going on with his nipples over there what would you have to say if i, if I were fighting him when they were announcing us and we're looking across, <laughs> looking at each other from across the cage, I would probably just go with both hands. <laughs> You'd have Korean. Like, All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Al Jermaine, listen. Kind of throw him off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, are you going to do anything at the Wayans over here? Do you have anything special planned? Are you going to be talking some smack in Atlantic City? No, I actually really like Brett Johns. We hung out at the Fighter Summit and he was telling me his brother's a huge fan of mine and, uh, when I was offered the two names of the fight, I asked, I hit, actually hit him up on Instagram and I asked him, I was like, um, is this the fight that you guys wanted kind of thing? Trying to figure out if he's the one that asked for the fight, trying to get a feel. I'm like, cause it, it, there's a different type of uh, way you take it, a, a challenge, you know, someone's kind of like specifically asking for you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so if this is the fight that you want. I'm going to make sure you get the fight that you want. So that's kind of the way I, I look at that kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, he's, we, we've been pretty cordial, but um, I know what it is. At the end of the day, we're all in the same weight class, and we're all chasing the same thing. So in order to get to my dreams, I have to crush his. And that's just the, that's just what it is. It's such a cutthroat sport, and uh, only one guy can be, go out there and be the winner for the night. Uh, hopefully the fans get a great fight, and uh, this way we can both somewhat feel like winners. But I got to get my hand raised by all costs. Al Jermaine Sterling's fighting April 21st, U UFC AC. It's going down in Jersey. It's going to be fun stuff. I have one last question, and I want to know what UFC fighter is your least favorite? Who can't you stand? Who is like you cringe? Is it a Colby Covington? Is it a Conor McGregor? Who is the one UFC fighter that you just cannot stand? <laughs> I don't have anybody that can't stand. I think I'm 
pretty respectful of everybody in terms of that we all do the same thing. I, you know, I don't really have like that high school. Oh, I can't stand this person because the interview and they sounded like this. And but I mean, there's some people I could be like, I would never hang out with that guy mm-hmm. or girl. Like she's such a. Let me not say loser. Well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I could never hang out with that person because they would just be just not a good time mm-hmm. at all. And uh, there's some guys you'd be like. I would like to have a beer with that guy because they just seem like my type of my type of person, you know. But uh, there's no no one I can say like oh, I just can't stand that so and so. But you know, it is it is what it is. Everyone's I feel like all the fighters are weird. To be doing this kind of sport, you have to have something a little bit off mm-hmm. upstairs, and uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it seems like you have the right attitude, right? I mean, you're you're seem like a fun loving guy. You're not looking for any trouble. You're going in there. You're, you're competing, and uh, these are people that are doing the same thing. They're all going for the same thing. So you seem like you have a lot of respect for the sport. What do you think of a Colby Covington? Uh, I don't know what to think about the guy. I, I if there's anything I would say is I think he's trying a little bit too hard. I think. Um, I think he's trying a little bit too hard to get attention. I think there's other ways he could go about getting attention. I'm not saying not talk crap, but I think some of the stuff he says is a little borderline over the top. And it's one thing if you're going to say what you say and stand by it. It's mm-hmm. another thing to say what you say and then kind of hide behind someone else and threaten to call the police and that kind of thing. I think that's a little... I'm like, as a fighter, it just seems kind of weird. Like, you're supposed to be the tough guy. You can't really can't do both. You know what I mean? You can't yeah. teeter that line. So I'm going to be the tough guy. I'm going to talk my crap and I'm only going to take my, my butt kicking like a like a man if someone confronts me or dish out the butt kicking if you decide to confront me. But you're not going to... Like the whole thing for Verdum, I don't know exactly what happened, the whole boomerang thing. And then him saying... Hey, he, I heard he said something for Fabricio first and Fabricio confronted him and then he kind of like starting to call the, I don't know. I don't know. If that's the case, that's kind of that's kind of weak if you ask me. Mm. And the whole thing with Mike Perry and the same, uh, talking about his ex-girlfriend. And I'm like, I, I don't really see. And mind you, I I remember my whole thing with Brian Carraway, but I never once slandered uh, Misha Tate about being how she looked or anything like that or her appearance or anything. I talked about Brian being second fiddle to her and only because she fights more, she was more active and he was okay with being a fighter and her being in the limelight and him not actually trying to chase his own dreams and ambitions. So one thing you're going to say, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to let my girlfriend pursue her dreams, that kind of thing. That's cool. But that wasn't the case with him. And I called him out for that. I'm like, dude, you need to take a fight. You've been pulling on the fights for the past four years. Are you going to fight? Are you a fighter? Stop taking up space in the rankings, that kind of thing. Um, but to say, oh, your horse face ratchet girlfriend was a little, it's crazy. It's a little, it's a little over the top. It was funny. <laughs> it was mean. Um, but it was over the top. It was over the top. It was like, dude, we we're going to start insulting, assaulting, I don't know, insulting mamas and, and families. I don't know. The fight's between you and I, mm. and, you know, I don't need to bring everybody else in that. I, I think that's just, that's just what it is. It's funny. It's funny you say that because when I anytime he tweets, it's like I hate that I laugh. You know, I don't. I to me personally, I'm not a big fan of him to be honest. But I like trash talk. But he just does it in a weird way. It seems a little too far, right? It seems too forced. Hundred percent. You know, but 100%. how funny though? Like when he says these things, he's like, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" <laughs> like the ratchet, like girlfriend thing. He's like, "What is going through your mind right now?" Do you think he has a dude. PR guy that's like pulling his hair out? Like, dude, are you serious right now? And the crazy thing is not like he's the most talented guy in that division. It's like, I can understand, like, imagine if Connor was saying stuff like that, it wouldn't have been like the end of the world. Like, people would not be like, oh, you can't talk like that because you suck. But people are saying to him, like, how are you talking like that? And you, 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 your physical abilities, what you, especially what you showed in your last few fights, you kind of, you don't suck, but people are saying, like, you suck. I'm not mm-hmm. saying he sucks, but people are saying you suck. And then the fight that I watched with Damian Maya was not looking good for him. And he was able to turn it around towards the end of the fight and, and pick up the decision win. But boy, he got busted up by a guy who's not known for his stand-up whatsoever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird thing. But he's, he's getting his name out there. Kudos to him for that. Um, but I just think there's a better way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you think? I mean, Jesus Leave Christ. Leave the girlfriends out of it, I think. <laughs> Yeah, he he goes a little bit too far. All right. Al Jermaine, listen, I mean, I have a million. I could talk to you all fucking night. It must be a New York thing here. I can And Queens represent to the girlfriend. Queens over here represent Queens in the house. Respect. 
Uh, <laughs> Long Island respect. I was actually in the building for uh, Chris Wyman's fight with uh, in the Coliseum. God damn, that place was electric. Were you there for that fight? You were there for the um, yeah, right, right in the front, cage side. Damn. Well, not cage, cage side, but right in the front with Al and the in the whole Law MMA crew, Sarah Longo crew. I mean, wasn't that electric? I mean, I, I, I was trying to tell people. I don't think people understood. It didn't translate on TV. Like if you were in that building, the Coliseum. For there's something about it that it was just completely fireworks. It's the hometown, the hometown hero. You know, it's just one of those things. You're, you're in the moment. Everyone knows who he is. He's the people's champ. He's Long Island's champ. You know, I think just about everybody in Long Island knows who Chris Chris Weidman is, and it's pretty cool to go out there and fight in your hometown, and everyone you've known from elementary school all the way through college comes down to watch and then they're rolling deep and uh to see you get a hit your hand raised after a three a, a three fight losing streak like that especially being finished and you know, it's controversial controversial losses and it's crazy you know i can only imagine the weight that was on his shoulders i know he talks about it and uh and it's an emotional thing for for him and he's just like i ah, you know finally able to win and show like what i'm really capable of and those last ones were all just a bad string of luck, and uh, we were we were all happy for him, man. I probably screamed so hard, I almost had a, I probably almost popped the, an- <laughs> well, I probably almost had an aneurysm in my head for as as hard as I was screaming, lost my voice. It was a, it was a great night, a great yeah, night. Something else, and his pop guy in there was just going ballistic. I mean, what heart his dad has too, huh? Oh, and I, if his dad was probably thirty years younger, he'd probably be fighting himself <laughs> <laughs> i bet i bet he looks like the most proud papa ever it's crazy man him jumping around charlie wyman yeah 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 <laughs> unbelievable anyway uh al Jermaine, thank you so much for coming on this chat room has been so civilized it's ridiculous i'm keeping a peek in there and everyone's like good luck great interview blah 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 you i mean you killed it tonight after the fight i'd love to have you come back on where do you see yourself at the end of the al Jermaine sterling career at the funk master's end where do you see yourself do you see yourself raising the gold in the ufc octagon hundred percent. I think I have all the, the physical tools and the skill set to do to do that. Um, when I try to stack myself up skill for skill with everybody in the division, I think I match up well with everybody. I, I really do believe that. My coaches truly believe that. Um, sometimes I go out there and I'm a little more timid, like early in my career. Because, you know, I didn't really trust to stand up as much as I did in training because 16 ounce gloves are safer than four ounce gloves. And uh, I wouldn't let them fly like the way I, I would do in practice and open up as much. But um, I, I think at this rate, I've been showing great improvement, great growth, and great comfortability in there. And uh, I think each fight, I'm just going to continue to keep getting better and show different wrinkles of my game. Um, I'm excited for this next one. I've been working on a couple things. And uh, hopefully, I, I, I get comfortable to, enough where I'm going to pull the trigger and uh, and hit it. And I think if I hit it, it's going to be a spectacular finish. So, um I'm excited for the future, you know. I just got to keep keep putting my head down, keep working. Uh my my motto put in work, cash out. It's uh it's a it's a lifestyle, man. This this is uh this is not an easy journey for I don't think for anybody. And the ups and downs, the highs and the lows, the highest highs, the lows, lows. Um I I just can't wait to get back in that win column and uh then just go from there, you know. One fight at a time. One fight at a time. One fight at a time, and this fight is April 21st. Aljamain Sterling will be fighting Brett Johns. Atlantic City, that's right. It's going down. Uh, check it out. It is free, a free card. So, guys, uh, everyone pull up a seat, get some popcorn. Aljamain's going to put some fireworks on. Uh, Aljamain, any last words to the MMA holes? Any sponsors you'd like to plug? Now is the time to do it. Uh, I want to say shout-out to my sponsors, High Performance Nutrition, HPN, if you guys want pre-workout that's what i use all the time i believe it or not is is vegan everything they have is vegan friendly so i use it all the time discount code elite funk or you guys can try out the cbd oil for all my cbd oil fanatics thc all that stuff um they don't sell thc but they have cbd oil um my discount code for that is funk um so go to my website algemanestone.com you can find all the information there all my latest vlogs or just go directly to my youtube channel and uh, I'll be making hats and T-shirts th- too. I, I try to make some stuff that look good, not like all the crazy graffiti things that you can actually wear in public and not feel like that guy. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so if you want some gear, some merchandise, you can hit me up on there. I do all my shipping and handling myself. So, you get some some gear from Aljamain Sterling with love from the funk. Go. That's awesome stuff. Now, Aljamain, before you go, I need you to do me one favor here. I need you to look into that camera. 
and say, I am Aljamain Sterling, and I am an MMA hole. The floor is yours. <laughs> is that really what I'm saying? <laughs> I have all my guests say it because we're going to cut it up as something. So you have to do it now. This, this is this is your big moment in the stage, in the spotlight. You need to express your love for the MMA holes and say, I'm Aljamain Sterling, and I am an MMA hole. Floor is yours. <laughs> the last part just sounds funny. <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm Aljamain Funkmaster Sterling, and I'm an MMA hole. There we go, Al Jermaine Sterling. Good luck, Atlantic City. I can't wait to watch the fight. And when you're done beating some ass, come back on anytime. I appreciate the interview. Thank you, Al Jermaine, and good luck. Thanks for having me. One take wonder goes, guys. One take wonder. All right, Al Jermaine Sterling. There he is. All right, Al Jermaine Sterling on the MMA holes. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Check it out. It's going down Saturday, April 21st. It is going down. Check it out. The number 8th versus the number 14th fighter. This is going to be a banging fight, man. A bantamweight fight. Big fight for Al Jermaine. And let me know what you guys think in the chat of Al Jermaine Sterling, the funk master. I thought he was fantastic. I really thought he was fantastic. Seriously, what a nice guy. The, the chat room was like, fuck, we can't troll this dude. He's a nice dude.